Why a DSO? In a letter dated August 17, 1918, amidst the turmoil of the Great War, then Detroit Symphony Orchestra President J. A. Runick posed a question, why a symphony orchestra during the war? Later, he answered his own question, because of the war. Because the soul of man craves music more during a trying period than at any other time. Because the Detroit Symphony Orchestra will play its part in keeping up the morale of the people in our city and elsewhere. Because the musicians who will form our orchestra, and Osip Gabrilovich, their leader, have promised a series of programs that will make the citizens of Detroit proud of an organization carrying its name. Runic could not have foreseen the outbreak of the Spanish flu one year later, or that his words might become the rallying cry that fortified Gabrilovich's commitment to invest in the orchestra, and then to take up the building of a great hall that would do justice to the sound that orchestra was capable of producing. No one could have predicted that we would experience a second epidemic. And then COVID-19 arrived, almost exactly 100 years after Orchestra Hall came into existence. But sitting on the other side of 100 years, his words ring true, as if they were written for our time. In 2019, the Detroit Symphony Orchestra partnered with the Detroit Historical Society and Museum to tell the centennial story of its home, Orchestra Hall. With exhibits on display at both the Max M. and Marjorie S. Fisher Music Center and the Detroit Historical Museum's Robert and Mary Ann Burry Community Gallery, Orchestra Hall 100 captivated visitors' attention through photography, artifacts, quotes, and of course, music. Little did the two organizations suspect that their work would become inaccessible to the public due to the ongoing coronavirus pandemic. Since that time, both the DSO and DHS have been intensely focused on maintaining connections with their audiences and with the people of Detroit. What follows is a virtual reconstruction of the Orchestra Hall 100 exhibition. While this presentation adheres closely to the artifacts and narrative of the original exhibit, it was important to both the DSO and Historical Society that this online version be a piece of living history, reflecting the challenging times in which it was created. To that end, it will conclude with a present-day perspective including a conversation between CEOs and Parsons and Ilana Rue. The legacy of Orchestra Hall transcends acoustics and boldface names. The building may literally sit at the corner of Woodward and Parsons, but metaphorically, it resides at the intersection of myriad overlapping narratives. The history of the Detroit Symphony Orchestra, the cultural aspirations of Detroit, the city's complex racial dynamics, Detroit's reputation as a jazz mecca, and the boom and bust economic cycles that have defined the city's plight in the 20th 
and 21st centuries. In the broadest sense, Orchestra Hall has been a mirror for what Detroit once was, what it has become, and the promise of what it could be in the future. The rise, fall, near death, and resurrection of Orchestra Hall over the last 100 years reflects the historical arc of Detroit itself. Orchestra Hall was built in six months during 1919. It was a mad dash initiated at the insistence of Osip Gabrilovich. When offered the job of music director by the Detroit Symphony Orchestra's board of directors, the Russian-born maestro said he would only come if they built him a concert hall. So they did. Designed by architect C. Howard Crane, Orchestra Hall cost $1 million to build, or about $15 million in today's dollars. The biggest donors to its construction were then DSO Board President William H. Murphy, a lumber baron, and Vice President Horace Dodge of auto fame. Dodge himself was often on site during construction, troubleshooting tricky engineering details. Perhaps he even arrived in his 1920 Dodge Model 30, now part of the collection of the Detroit Historical Society and on display at the DSO in October 2019. Orchestra Hall was renowned for spectacular acoustics from the day it opened at Woodward and Parsons site of the former Westminster Church. Orchestra Hall is revered as one of the best places in the world to hear classical music. The hall promotes an intensely warm and vibrant sound with the perfect balance of resonance and clarity across the entire dynamic range. What's the secret to Orchestra Hall's acoustics? It's a combination of factors, including the hall's intimate size and so-called lyric shape resembles a shoebox rectangle but with slightly curved walls the shape creates a rewarding balance of direct and indirect sound. Hard plaster surfaces that do not absorb sound and promote resonance. Angles, curves, and ornamentation that produce the ideal ratio of direct and indirect sound for delivering clarity. Fantastic bass response. Resonant, low-end frequencies that our ears perceive as warmth. Orchestra Hall's bass response is amplified by a tall fly tower above the stage and a trap room below the stage. These cavities act as resonating chambers and produce just the right amount of delayed sound coming from the stage to further enhance bass frequencies. During the 1920s and 30s, the greatest conductors, soloists, and composers in classical music appeared at Orchestra Hall, including Igor Stravinsky, Richard Strauss, Bruno Walter, Fritz Reiner, Pablo Casals, Vladimir Horowitz, and Yasha Heifetz. But it all began with the incredible music making by the DSO and Osip Gabrilovich on Orchestra Hall's opening night, October 23, 1919. Taken from newspaper reports of the event, as conductor Osip Gabrilovich marched in from the wings, a sold out audience of more than 2,000 people and 80 plus musicians of the Detroit Symphony Orchestra all rose in a single sweeping gesture of admiration and adulation. The ovation continued for five minutes. The epic program included the Star Spangled Banner, Weber's Overture to Oberon, Mozart's Concerto for Two Pianos, 
Bach's Concerto No. 2 for three pianos, and Beethoven's Symphony No. 5. Charlotte M. Tarsney wrote the next day in the Detroit Free Press, Thus was Orchestra Hall, the building devoted to music and artistic enterprise, for which Detroit has waited these many years, dedicated impressively Thursday evening. Aseb Gabrilovich was the Detroit Symphony Orchestra's first great music director. Born in St. Petersburg, Russia, in 1878, he was already a world-renowned pianist and fast-rising conductor when he first guest conducted with the DSO in 1917. He signed a one-year contract in 1918, and in 1919 became the orchestra's music director, a post he held until his untimely death in 1936 from stomach cancer at the age of 57. Gabrilovich's 18-year tenure marked the DSO's first golden age as he built the orchestra into a national power. He made recordings with the DSO at Orchestra Hall for the Victor label and led the ensemble on tours throughout the Midwest and East Coast, including highly praised performances in New York. Gabrilovich was a deeply expressive poetic musician. Under his baton, the DSO played with a singing ensemble tone, a liquid legato, and beautifully modulated colors and dynamics. He was also a beloved figure. He and his wife, Clara Clemens, Mark Twain's daughter, were a Detroit power couple. The conductor's early death not only robbed the DSO of its transformative leader, but was also a tragedy mourned worldwide. It was also the beginning of the end of the DSO's and Orchestra Hall's golden age together. During the Great Depression, the DSO had defaulted on the bonds that financed Orchestra Hall. In 1939, these financial pressures, along with changing neighborhood demographics, pushed the DSO without their leader, Gabrilovich, to move to the cavernous 4,600-seat Masonic Temple Auditorium. The next dozen years were volatile for the DSO, which ultimately went out of business in 1942, came back to life in 1943, disbanded again in 1949, and reformed yet again in 1951. With the DSO performing at the Masonic Temple Auditorium, Orchestra Hall was rechristened the Paradise Theater in 1941. For the next 10 years, the venue was one of the leading hotspots for African American performers in America. The finest jazz musicians in the country played the Paradise, including Louis Armstrong, Duke Ellington, Count Basie, Ella Fitzgerald, Dizzy Gillespie, and several others. For many black Detroiters, as well as a number of white aficionados drawn to jazz, the Paradise became an indispensable part of daily life and underscored Detroit's reputation as a jazz mecca. The theater took its name from the Paradise Valley, the center of black commercial life in Detroit, located just south and east of Orchestra Hall. Performances at the Paradise Theater were stage shows featuring one or more headliners, a comedian, dancers, and a movie. Evening admission was 50 cents, and matinees were just 36 cents. The Paradise closed in November 1951 in the midst of changing popular tastes. Big bands fell out of favor, Vaudeville-like stage shows came to seem old-fashioned, and early R&B and doo-wop groups were capturing the attention of record buyers. But nearly seven decades after its closing, 
The Paradise Theater remains a powerful symbol of Detroit's African-American musical heritage and a deep source of cultural pride within Detroit's black community and among music lovers everywhere. The official record shows that Detroit theater moguls Ben and Lou Cohen bought Orchestra Hall in 1941 and opened the Paradise Theater. However, some historians say a group of Paradise Valley businessmen had previously tried to purchase Orchestra Hall and were denied approval due to restrictive covenants and real estate redlining that prevented African Americans from buying property outside a few segregated neighborhoods. Relying on oral history, some Paradise Valley experts believe the rebuked black businessmen worked out a backroom deal to become silent partners in the theater with the Cohen brothers, though no evidence has surfaced that confirms this theory. Orchestra Hall did not sit empty after the Paradise Theater closed in November 1951. The Reverend James Lofton, a charismatic African-American preacher with a congregation of an estimated 5,000 or more, bought the building for a reported $250,000 and made it home for his Church of Our Prayer from 1952 to 1957. The church boasted a dynamic gospel choir heard on record and weekly radio broadcasts. In the same period, the DSO, which moved from the Masonic Temple Auditorium to the new Ford Auditorium on the riverfront in 1956, returned to Orchestra Hall periodically to record in the hall's superior acoustics. Under music director Paul Perret, the DSO made 22 LPs at Orchestra Hall for the Mercury label from 1953 to 1959 that are still prized for their sonic splendor. Perret's tenure from 1953 to 1962 was a second golden age of artistry and financial stability for the DSO. But by the late 1950s, Orchestra Hall was entering a long period of decline. The building sat unused and decaying for the entire decade of the 1960s. A group led by businessman Max Osnos bought Orchestra Hall in 1958 with plans to restore it. But these plans never came to fruition. They sold it in 1963 to the Nederlander Theater Organization, who also failed to renovate the building. In the fall of 1970, Orchestra Hall nearly met its end with a wrecking ball. A restaurant chain from the East Coast, Gino's Hamburgers, bought the crumbling building with plans to demolish it in two weeks. Orchestra Hall needed a champion and found one in Paul Ganson, a young DSO bassoonist. Ganson quickly formed Save Orchestra Hall, Inc., a grassroots organization that worked swiftly with the city officials to secure a stay of execution and began raising funds. In 1972, Save Orchestra Hall bought back the building, which by then had live birds in the balcony and dead rodents in the aisles. The restoration odyssey unfolded persistently generating donors large and small and bringing together champions across racial, cultural, and geographic divides. The cause acquired powerful allies in real estate developer Sam Frankel and other community and business leaders. The Chamber Music Society of Detroit began presenting concerts at Orchestra Hall in 1976, a key turning point and violinist Arnold Steinhardt was quoted saying Orchestra Hall was among the very finest halls in the world. The drive to restore Orchestra Hall picked up momentum in the late 1970s and early 1980s with a series of fundraisers and concerts, 
which included recitals by eminent classical musicians like violinist Nathan Milstein and soprano Jesse Norman, to recreations of Paradise Theatre shows starring band leader Jay McShann. The Detroit Symphony Orchestra started playing Friday night concerts in the building in 1984. Finally, in the fall of 1989, after 19 years and $7 million in renovations, the DSO returned to Orchestra Hall full-time, 50 years after leaving. The return to Orchestra Hall in 1989 and the arrival in 1990 of charismatic music director Nimi Yervi sparked another golden age for the DSO. But more work remained. Orchestra Hall still lacked basic patron amenities and adequate backstage facilities. At the turn of the century, the DSO launched a landmark $60 million expansion including a 135,000 square foot addition to Orchestra Hall, with a soaring atrium lobby, two smaller performance spaces, the Cube and Alice Hall, and an education wing. The Max M. Fisher Music Center, affectionately referred to as the Max, opened in 2003 and further development in Orchestra Hall's neighborhood included a DSO-financed office building, a parking deck, and an adjacent Detroit Public Schools Performing Arts High School on DSO-donated land. All of this provided a southern anchor for the Midtown Renaissance. In recent years, under music director Leonard Slatkin, now music director laureate, the DSO is reaching further into the community than ever before with sweepingly diverse artistic offerings, an ever-growing menu of education and community programs, and live digital webcasts that take music from Orchestra Hall around the block and around the world. On January 22nd, the Detroit Symphony Orchestra named Italian conductor Yadar Benjamini its music director to succeed Leonard Slatkin in the fall of 2020. You have rightly deserved the future you're about to be delivered. And with that, I am thrilled and have the high honor to share with you today that the board has confirmed Yadar Benjamini as our next maestro. Later that week, between performances of Berlioz's Symphony Fantastique at Orchestra Hall, Yadar and his wife Lydia were guests at the opening reception of 100 Years of Music, Magic, and Community, displayed in the Robert and Mary Ann Burry Community Gallery at the Detroit Historical Museum. Busts from the Historical Society's collection of past DSO music directors and other important conductors were on display. With news of his appointment so fresh, there was only time to include Yadar's photo alongside the three-dimensional likenesses of Gabrilovich, Pere, Erling, Dorati, Yervi, Slatkin, and others. Joel Stone, senior curator for the Detroit Historical Society and artist who created these tributes, recently finished Jotter's bust, and the complete collection now awaits the return of patrons. Museum guests of all ages fell in love with the exhibition. Three-year-old Trinity was one of these visitors. Her aunt said, we visited the Detroit Historical Museum with my niece Trinity, and the DSO exhibit was by far her favorite. She read the music on the stand, pushed the button, and turned around to direct the orchestra. I've never seen anything like this before. After a lengthy visit, she insisted on returning to the orchestra room. She said she wants to play the violin, and I'm on it immediately. I just wanted to share one of the many ways the DSO affects our youth. This exhibit is truly amazing. 
Less than two months later, amid the excitement of the dawning of a new era in Orchestra Hall, what we thought we knew about the future became dubious with the ill-timed arrival of COVID-19. Social distancing, stay-at-home orders, and the public closures of both the Max and the Detroit Historical Museum followed. Concerts were halted, and the Centennial Exhibition stood in place, frozen in time, with no way for the public to view it. For the staff and musicians of the Detroit Symphony Orchestra, it quickly became imperative to stay connected with audiences. The DSO is recognized as the most accessible orchestra on the planet. Now was the time to prove it. Operating from the belief that music is courageous, unifying, powerful, and calming. And with resilience and technology in its DNA, the DSO committed itself to keep the music playing during the COVID-19 crisis. Immediately, the orchestra lifted fees for DSO Replay, its on-demand archived collection of live from Orchestra Hall performances, so that anyone, anywhere, could access the music. From March to May, Replay has been watched for more than 1.3 million minutes, which is the equivalent of 11,000 two-hour performances. Knowing that nothing beats the communal nature of watching a concert together, the DSO began to reshare the replay videos as watch parties on Facebook Live. Only this time, the musicians and guest artists were able to introduce the music and even participate in live chat, interacting with fans in real time. With schools closed nationwide and thousands of parents tasked with homeschooling, Educational concert series watch parties were curated and played every Friday afternoon. For the DSO's 400-plus Civic Youth Ensemble students, virtual masterclasses were held. A weekly Saturday morning CYE at Home lesson was shared on Facebook, and auditions for the fall season shifted to online. An intermezzo series was launched for subscribers and donors, providing them with a way to stay in touch and learn about each section of the orchestra. The ingenuity of DSO musicians was exhibited virtually. The cello section performed Bach's first suite from their own homes. My name is Peter McCaffrey. Myself and five of my colleagues from the Detroit Symphony Cello Section have a project that we are very excited to share. Over the course of the next few weeks, we will be recording the complete third solo suite by Bach. We will each take on one movement, and in the spirit of social distancing, we will record it each from the privacy of our own little home studios. And dozens of other solo video performances were created. Through technology, musicians were even able to perform together, yet separate to record Elgar's Pomp and Circumstance for the graduating class of 2020, whose ceremonies were widely canceled due to social distancing. As a community-supported orchestra, the DSO also invited the community to play along with its musicians for virtual side-by-sides and a daily Play on Your Porch initiative. we wanted to play on the porch was first of all it's a beautiful day and we've all been kind of sequestered to our homes so it was a reason to get a few people outside some fresh air and also we just wanted to bring a little bit of joy to a time that seems really dark for a lot of people um, and music has always been something that has helped all of us as musicians but uh, playing it for our audiences is something we've missed so much. So it was really great to get to connect with the community. It's really sad not to see everybody every day. You get used to communicating with them um, and being with them and making music with them really closely. 
Um, and it's kind of weird not doing that. It's, it's you're kind of sequestered into your own house and practicing and trying to get better, but it's, it's nothing like playing music. And this, even though we were, I don't know, 10 feet apart, it was still nice to actually hear somebody and, and play off of that. We really miss that. <laughs> Since March, hundreds of videos by musicians of all ages, amateur and professionals alike, have been shared on social media. And this community engagement through music is just getting started at the DSO. As it became clear that Detroit was enmeshed in a historic moment, the Detroit Historical Society shifted its primary focus to the responsibility of documenting history in real time. As an organization that was born in the wake of the 1918 flu pandemic, the society was literally made for times like this. It quickly rose to the challenge of contemporary collecting during a global pandemic. Within days of the shelter-in-place order, the society launched a new oral history project which documents Detroiters' experiences while sheltering in place. Later, it created a public memorial garden at the Detroit Historical Museum and invited the public to contribute rocks painted to memorialize those who were lost during this time. As the emergency phase of the pandemic passed, the society also began collecting artifacts from the pandemic in Detroit. History is a powerful teacher, and DHS knew that the lessons from our past could offer Detroiters both instruction and comfort while they were sheltered, keeping us connected and engaged as we found our way through a drastic shift in our day-to-day -day realities. Recognizing that the primary avenue for reaching Detroiters was online, the society quickly amplified its digital presence. It offered a free, updated history curriculum online for parents educating children at home, provided historical research aids for history buffs who suddenly had time to indulge long-time interests, and created original video content in short form designed to engage viewers with the stories of past Detroiters and the history of the region. Of course, with its museums closed, DHS needed a way to provide access to its award-winning exhibitions as well. Virtual tours and exhibits had been a long-time goal for DHS, and the shutdown provided the catalyst it needed for its first foray into the realm of digital exhibitions. The partnership with DSO and the beautiful exhibition languishing behind closed doors at the museum and the MAX came immediately to mind for the Society's first virtual exhibit. Together, the DSO and DHS began to talk about how to virtually share the story of Orchestra Hall as told through its joint exhibition. For both organizations, it was important that any online presentation tell that story through the present day, including the coronavirus, so that it exists as an artifact from this time to be preserved in the permanent collection of the Detroit Historical Society. In June 2020, DSO President and CEO Ann Parsons and Detroit Historical Society President and CEO Alana Rue caught up via video conference, the defining technology of the coronavirus era. They discuss the Orchestra Hall exhibit and how each organization is adapting to serve the public in light of the current pandemic. It is so great to see you. Um, oh my gosh, good to see you too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we are uh, used to being up and down the street from one another. Um, and here we are, uh, probably many, many miles apart, but... Uh, but feeling yeah. close together. I know, it's so good to see your smiling face. And um, during this time, we've missed um, the things that we would have been doing together. And who would have thought a year ago, maybe longer than that, when we first started talking about this, that it would 
come to this point where this is the way that we are in front of our patrons um, talking about our projects that we're working on together. I know, you know, I, um, I'm not one of those people that really knew what Zoom was before all this. <laughs> and now I'm using it as a verb and, and asking people to use Zoom. And um, anyway, it's, it's really, uh, it's true. You know, we think about when you and I first sat down and talked about how could we do more things together and how could we partner? And um, I've always loved your institution. And uh, so uh, this particular project seemed to be the right way to go and look what happened it just uh, it went off and almost had a life of its own oh I know it I know it. it's been terrific um so let me ask you I mean given everything that's changed and there has been so much since we launched all of this together um what's been the most rewarding aspect of our partnership so far to you you know I can't help but um think about that day that we were all side by side by side mm -hmm. when the exhibit opened in January and it happened to coincide with our new music director Yadar Benyamini mm -hmm. coming to town and, and we were able to be on your stage that you created that looks just like Orchestra Hall stage and the three of us could stand there and uh, celebrate what a true partnership looks like when you work together towards a common goal. Right. Uh, what about you? What about no, you? well, I agree. That was that was such a special night. Yadar was so incredibly charming. We just felt honored to be able to meet him, you know, for us so early on. You know, people who came and it was a packed house. That's kind of hard to imagine now, isn't it? I mean, we had right. your patrons, right. and my patrons and board members and friends and donors. Um, but it was truly a, a unique Detroit moment. Um, and, and that was really fun. Um, you know, honestly, for me, though, I think it's just the partnership as a whole. I mean, you were one of the first people who reached out to me when I was new in my role here. And so okay. I've always, you know, appreciated that and felt that affinity. I grew up, um, I'm, you know, a musician myself, amateur musician, but um, going to Orchestra Hall. And so to have this opportunity professionally to partner has been really meaningful to me you know, and, and also personally. Um, and we certainly hope at the Historical Society that we can help other institutions tell their milestone stories. And so what was particularly rewarding is having the opportunity to test all this and do it with friends. So we've figured out how to do it, things we might have done differently, but what we have created has been so remarkable in both of our institutions. Um, and, you know, I think more recently, one of the really cool parts of the partnership is that when we were all forced to take our um, content digital, that both of our teams independently said, oh, we have to do something with them. Let's do it together. So this is part of that. Yeah, so great. So you talked about um, these really recent times and how it's changed mm -hmm. all of us. We all um, think about the role that our mission plays in connecting to um, communities. And certainly when there's a moment of, of change or threat or uh, uh, an alarm, which a pandemic brings all of that you know, to, to bear, um, we, we think about music and the role music can play. And, but the way we make music normally is to gather together mm -hmm. and to gather crowds, as you suggest. So everything right. we do um, is sort of against what we are allowed to do. So the DSO was really happy to, um, you know, to work with, with partners um, like you and think about what can we do as opposed to focusing on what we can't do. Mm -hmm. And again, Orchestra Hall Centennial was, um, you know, it's such a powerful narrative in the first place around the city of Detroit and the people of Detroit and the resilience of Detroit. Mm -hmm. It's a real narrative of generation after generation of, of endurance and resilience. So in a way, it's a perfect story to tell right now. And, um, you know, the DSO has tried so hard through all of its initiatives. We've got something called hashtag keep the music playing mm -hmm. and um, everything from our musicians playing on their porches to uh, and in their yards to working on educational content. And um, again, back to the DSO, 100, um, this is a really important time to tell stories and to inspire people as a result, because there will be a time that feels more normal than this time. But while this time is going on, I think it's a great time for our institutions to partner together to provide 
new content for people who are sitting at home and who can't do all the things that they are normally doing. Um, so, you know, to talk a little bit about what it's been like for your organization uh, during this time. Sure, sure. Well, first I have to start by saying how much my family and I have loved your online content. So I have two kids in elementary school who have just started band and um, the opportunity to be able to see professional musicians in their own space playing is, I mean, it's truly magical. That has, it has been wonderful. So I'm thrilled that you are gonna keep it coming. I'm sure like us, you've realized, you know, um, even more so how this will continue afterwards, you know, and it has been such a wonderful way to reach people. Um, so as a matter of fact, to your question, we have our own hashtag, which is um, hashtag we were made for this. Oh, so, nice. um, yeah. you know, the society actually, um, we're about to celebrate our own centennial next year, as you know. So we were formed in 1921, just a couple of years after the last flu pandemic of 1918. You know, so I've been thinking a lot about that, right? So what was that like? And the, then the creation and the need that, um, that people felt to um, you know, ensure that the artifacts and the stories of Detroit lived on. And I wonder if that hasn't been part of that, um, you know, which is interesting. So, um, but most of the time people think about museums as um, using history to tell, you know, and we do that, right? We, we take the historical stories and it informs and hopefully teaches us um, to not make the same mistakes in the future. Um, but right now, um, things are a little bit different and, um, we're really focused not only on providing the historical context, but also collecting stories of Detroiters who are going through this right now. And even, um, you know, recently we have, there, there are two significant issues. So one of them is the virus. The other one is racism. And, um, we have begun collecting oral histories of people who are living through this time, quarantined at home. You know, how did that change you? And then, um, you know, again, morphing um, more recently and tragically into um, the uprisings that are happening around the country and here in Detroit. So it's something that we're really looking at and we need to act quickly to preserve these stories. So we're hoping that people will collect artifacts from, you know, if they're protesting or on a march or from being at home. We're collecting masks, um, stories of healthcare heroes and everyday workers and those of us who are trying desperately to homeschool kids while working. <laughs> this right. is a place we've never been before, but I feel the acute responsibility to collect the stories and artifacts so that 50 and 100 years from now, Detroiters will understand what it was like to live through this time that we're in right now. You know, it's so fascinating to hear you talk about this because I know people think that historical societies are, are always looking back and that history is about what's behind us. And what you've just said really reminds us that we make history every day. And, yeah. and it's the choices we make and it's the stories we tell that allow for history to be written. Oh. And so I think it's so forward thinking of you to to have that as part of your active mission and vision for your institution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really, it's cool. It's, it happens behind the scenes all the time. Um, and, but now it's really coming much more into the forefront. It's, we call it contemporary collecting. And so our <laughs> staff's trained to do that. And, um, you know, especially through this oral history, I have to give a specific request. I would love for you to, um, to share with us your oral history at some point here. Maybe it's when we're all through it, but to, uh, you know, I think Detroiters should know. Um, you know, what the CEO of the Detroit Symphony Orchestra was going through. How did it affect your musicians and your staff members in the community? Um, you know, we know that people rely on history when times are tough and they certainly look to music um, as a place of healing, um, you know, and um, to help them feel better. So um, have you found um, during this time that the demand for your music has increased? Uh, of course, people talk about missing Orchestra Hall and missing. We built up this this personality of our building so that people have been uh, dying to come and be 
part of it. And um, renewals for next year are incredibly strong with our new music director and the anticipation of what's to come. Uh, having said that, the response to all the digital work that our musicians and our staff have put together um, has been, I, I won't say overwhelming, but it's been very comforting. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it gives us inspiration to continue to create new content all the time. And that's what we're doing. And, and we really need to do that because, um, you know, the, the line artists have to make art and it's not a line. It's really just a belief. Um, and musicians have to make music and they are the ones that are hit hardest by this because they don't really aspire to do this alone. They aspire to do this together as mm -hmm. colleagues and orchestra is um, the, the, the strength of the sum of all of its parts. Um, Having said that, we have made the most of it and they have made the most of it by really showcasing them as individuals and our audiences have loved learning more about where they live and yeah. um, what they're wearing when they're not on stage. Oh, and, um, what, are they, what, are they, what are they playing um, to keep themselves busy and how are they creating new art in this new day? So I just think the, the this is a very wonderful community, as you know, um, very warm and responsive. And uh, uh, I think the, the fact is we're just gonna keep doing what we can do and using the digital space as we are doing together in our partnership and um, just doing the best we can to use this time to bring people together and to remind people of um, the, the beauty in the world and uh, the way that music tells stories and um, does actually create a sense of history. Uh, just like you do. And mm -hmm. so I just want to say thanks so much for um, for just being you and for your institution being so much fun to play in the sandbox with. <laughs> and um, just hope everything goes well for you um, in the in the weeks to come. Well, I, I, I echo your sentiments. This, this partnership has been a treat, um, you know, again, personally and professionally for our whole teams, I think. Great friendships have um, come out of this. And um, I really think it's the first of many opportunities that we'll have going forward. Um, and that we've set a great example here for the other institutions in working so closely together. So I'm grateful for you. Um, we wish you all the best too. And I, just, I can't wait to see you in person to toast I know. And, and to be able to give each other a hug. This is I a very know. big Detroit <laughs> thing. <laughs> Miss you too. Thanks a lot. Be well. Thank be you. safe. Bye-bye. Over the past 100 years, ever since Orchestra Hall was built at the height of the last major pandemic, the DSO, its home, and the city of Detroit all seem to share the same spirit of resiliency. Orchestra Hall deserves a special bow during its 100th year. It has not only survived, but it is thriving in ways unlike any other point in its history. The Detroit Symphony Orchestra will keep the music playing.